the Buddha, Buddhism, and psychology. The history of Buddhism spans almost 2,500 years from its origin in India, through its spread to most parts of Asia and, in the 20th and 21st centuries, to the West. The English term Buddhism correctly indicates that the religion is characterized by a devotion to the Buddha, Buddhas or Buddhahood. Buddha is not a proper name, but a descriptive title meaning awakened one or enlightened one. This implies that most people are seen, in a spiritual sense, as being asleep, unaware of how things really are. Buddha is a title. Buddhism can be divided into three major schools, Theravada and Mahayana, and Vajrayana. Today, Theravada is the dominant form of Buddhism in Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, Burma, Myanmar, and Laos. Mahayana is dominant in China, Japan, Taiwan, Nepal, Mongolia, Korea and most of Vietnam. Vajrayana is associated with Tibetan Buddhism. Before Buddhism, Tibet had its own native shamanistic religion called Bon. As Buddhism became established, Bon ideas and practices merged with the new religion to influence what was to become Tibetan Buddhism. Historically, one school grew from another and different views emerged gradually. It is important to realize that there is nothing here that the Buddha did not teach. The Life of Siddhartha Gautama or Buddha Sakyamuni One full moon night, sleeping in the palace, the queen had a vivid dream. She felt herself being carried away by four devas or spirits to Lake Anotata in the Himalayas. After bathing her in the lake, the devas clothed her in heavenly cloths, anointed her with perfumes, and bedecked her with divine flowers. Soon after a white elephant, holding a white lotus flower in its trunk, appeared and went round her three times, entering her womb through her right side. Finally the elephant disappeared and the queen awoke, knowing she had been delivered an important message, as the elephant is a symbol of greatness in Nepal. The next day, early in the morning, the queen told the king about the dream. The king was puzzled and sent for some wise men to discover the meaning of a dream. The wise men said, Your Majesty, you are very lucky. The Devas have chosen our queen as the mother of the purest one and the child will become a very great being. The king and queen were very happy when they heard this. Similar to other religious leaders, many miraculous stories were associated with his birth. After ten months, the moment for giving birth. Mahamaya was passing by the Lumbini garden when, quick as a flash of lightning, she grasped a branch of the Laksha tree with her right hand. The child emerged from her right side and Brahma and Indra descended to earth to make offerings, wrapping him in a pure silk cloth. After the gods and Nagas bathed him, the child took seven steps in each of the four directions. He stated that this would be his last reincarnation. He was given the name Siddhartha Gautama. Siddhartha means one who has achieved his aim. Gautama was his clan name. He was sometimes referred to as Sakyamuni which means the sage of the Sakyas. When the king saw the child he felt as if all his wishes had been. He invited a Brahmin seer to make predictions about the prince's future. Asita came down from the Himalayas to meet the newborn prince. Instantly, the ascetic rose from his seat and recognizing in the young child the eighty signs that are pledges to a highly religious vocation, and foreseeing with his supernormal vision the child's future greatness, saluted him with clasped hands. The royal father did likewise. The great ascetic smiled at first and then was sad. Questioned regarding his mingled feelings, he answered that he smiled because the prince would eventually become a Buddha, an enlightened one, and he was sad because he would not be able to benefit from the superior wisdom of the enlightened one owing to his prior death and rebirth in a formless plane. The seer told the king, there are signs that the boy could become either a Chakravadin king, a ruler of the entire world, or a fully enlightened Buddha. However, since the time for Chakravadin kings is now past it is certain that he will become a Buddha and that his beneficial influence will pervade the thousand million worlds like the rays of the sun then the king said what shall my son see to make him retire from the world? The seer replied four signs what for? Asked the king a decrepit old man, a diseased man, a dead man and a monk, these four will make the prince retire from the world replied Asada. Siddhartha was raised as a Hindu. His parents assumed that he would succeed his father later in his life. His parents were concerned about a prophecy that Asita gave at the time of his birth. They raised him in a state of luxury in the hope that he would become attached to earthly things and to pleasure. This would make it less likely that he choose the religious life. Suddhodana thought that he might lose his precious son and tried his best to make him attached to earthly objects. 
he surrounded him with all kinds of luxury and indulgence, in order to retain his attachment for pleasures of the senses and prevent him from undertaking a vow of solitariness and poverty. He kept Siddhartha in a walled palace with gardens, fountains, palaces, music, dances, etc. Countless charming young ladies attended on Siddhartha to make him cheerful and happy. The king wanted to keep away from Siddhartha the four signs which would move him to enter into the ascetic life. From this time on said the king, let no such persons be allowed to come near my son. It will never do for my son to become a Buddha. What I would wish to see is, my son exercising sovereign rule and authority over the four great continents and the two thousand attendant isles, and walking through the heavens surrounded by a retinue thirty-six leagues in circumference. He placed guards in each of the four directions, in order that none of the four kinds of men might come within sight of his son. At the age of sixteen, he was married to his wife Yasodhara. When he was twenty-nine, his wife had a son, Rayala. Shortly after his son's birth, some sources say that Siddhartha snuck out of the palace by chariot. Other sources say he had four visions. Siddhartha was deeply disturbed by seeing an elderly, helpless, frail man. He also saw an emaciated and depressed man suffering from an advanced disease. Siddhartha spotted a grieving family carrying the corpse of one of their own to a cremation site. He reflected deeply upon the suffering brought about by old age, illness and death. Then, he saw a religious mendicant who led a reclusive life of meditation, and was calm and serene. The four encounters motivated him to follow the path of the mendicant and find a spiritual solution to the problems brought about by human suffering. He said let me go beyond the miseries of this samsara, or worldly life, by renouncing this world of miseries and sorrows. This mundane life, with all its luxuries and comforts, is absolutely worthless. I also am subject to decay and am not free from the effect of old age. Worldly happiness is transitory. He left his wife, child, luxurious lifestyle, and future role as a leader of his people in order to seek truth. It was an accepted practice at the time for some men to leave their family and lead the life of an ascetic. Siddhartha left his home forever, donning yellow robes and shaving his head, to take up yogic practices. He first tried meditation, which he learned from two teachers. Siddhartha felt that these were valuable skills. However, meditation could not be extended forever, he eventually had to return to normal waking consciousness and face the unsolved problems relating to birth, sickness old age and death. Siddhartha then joined a group of similarly minded students of Brahmanism in a forest where he practiced breath control and fasted intensely for six years. He practiced severe tapas, austerities, and pranayama, breath control. He is said to have brought himself to the brink of death by only eating a few grains of rice each day. Some sources say that he consumed only a spoonful of bean soup per day. This technique produced a series of physical discomforts. Ultimately, he rejected this path as well. Given food by a young woman, he sought a comfortable place to sit and eat it. He found a large tree, now known as the Great Body, or Tree of Wisdom. Upon consuming the physical food, he realized that he was starved for spiritual nourishment. Going deep into meditation, he contemplated his journey with its temptations and desires but did not yield to them. He realized that neither the extremes of the mortification of the flesh or of hedonism would lead to enlightenment. He determined that a better path to achieve the state of nirvana, a state of liberation and freedom from the suffering, was to pursue a middle way. This way was largely defined by moderation and meditation. One night at the age of 35, he was seated underneath the body tree. The events under the body tree are often described in mythological terms in Buddhist literature and art. His experiences are portrayed as a battle with Mara, the Buddhist equivalent of Satan. He began to experience some major spiritual breakthroughs. During the first watch of the night, he developed the ability to recall the events of his previous reincarnations in detail. During the second watch, he was able to see how the good and bad deeds that many living entities performed during their lifetimes led to the nature of their subsequent reincarnation into their next life. During the third watch, he learned that he had progressed beyond spiritual defilements, craving, desire, hatred, hunger, thirst, exhaustion, fear, doubt, and delusions. The legends tell us that he came out of the meditation victorious, his face shining with illumination and splendor, having attained nirvana.
Nirvana is the completion of the path of Buddhism in which the person has achieved self-enlightenment and all delusion and anguish are permanently ended. He got up and danced in divine ecstasy for seven days and nights around the sacred body, after which he returned to a normal state of consciousness filled with incredible compassion for all. He had an overwhelming desire to share his illumination with humanity. Thus, Siddhartha was a bodhisattva, one who has achieved enlightenment but chooses to remain in this world who help those who are suffering. He expressed the experience of his samadhi, the state of consciousness in which absoluteness is experienced, attended with all knowledge, and joy or oneness. Buddha Sakyamuni said I thus behold my mind released from the defilement of sensual pleasures, released from the defilement of heresy, released from the defilement of ignorance. He had attained nirvana and he would never again be reincarnated into a future life. He had attained enlightenment. He became a savior, deliverer, and redeemer. The Buddha left his wondrous body tree behind, venturing out into the world to teach others who were seeking wisdom and enlightenment. The subsequent teachings of the Buddha are the foundation of Buddhism. Indian culture has not been as concerned with recording precise dates as have Chinese or Roman cultures, so datings cannot always be arrived at with accuracy. All sources agree that Siddhartha was 80 when he died. With various margins of error, researchers see Siddhartha's death as between 422 and 399 BCE, with 404 BCE as most likely, giving his dates as circa 484 to 404 BCE, a very basic overview of Buddhism. The Buddha's Teachings, Three Baskets or Pitakas The Sutra Pitaka comprises the bulk of the teachings of the Buddha, sermons taught by Buddha and his teachers. The Vinaya Pitaka consists of discourses mainly concerned with rules and regulations of the monastic community, rules of the order. The Abharma Pitaka deals with philosophy and were debated extensively as there was never much debate about the Vinaya and Sutra Baskets. This chart shows the foundation of Buddhism. We will be discussing these sections briefly. Siddhartha Gautama as we have learned is the founder of Buddhism. The Three Jewels, or Turatna, is the basic creed of Buddhism. Three Bodies, or Trikaya, is the metaphysical understanding of the Buddha which can be interpreted differently between the different sects. The Four Noble Truths can be viewed as a medical model with a diagnosis of dissatisfaction, or Dukkha, a pathology stating it has a cause a prognosis whereas it is curable, and a treatment in which is the eightfold path is the treatment. Dukkha comes from Sanskrit translated as, dissatisfaction, suffering, misery, or bitterness. The eightfold path, or marga, is displayed very simply here. Buddha is a Sanskrit word which means noble awakened one. As we learned, Sakyamuni Buddha attained complete liberation under the body tree, attained true, unsurpassed awakening and brought liberation to infinite sentient beings. With his great compassion, great wisdom, and great supernatural powers, he became the founder of Buddhism for this Saha world and a teacher of human and heavenly beings. Dharma is a Sanskrit word which refers to the Tripitaka, the collection of the Buddha's teachings, with its twelve divisions. All the teachings the Buddha proclaimed were compiled together by his disciples Anana and Mahikasyapa into the Sutra, Vinaya, and Abharma divisions of the Tripitaka. The Tripitaka contains explanations of the truths of life and the universe. Sangha is a Sanskrit word which means community, peace and happiness, and purity. Generally, the male and female monastics are known as the Sangha. The Sangha is heir to the work of the Buddha and teaches the Dharma for the benefit of living beings. The first noble truth describes the nature of life and our personal experience of this impermanent, ever-changing world. All beings desire happiness, safety, peace, and comfort. We desire what is satisfying, pleasurable, joyful, and permanent. However, the very nature of existence is impermanent, always changing, and therefore incapable of fully satisfying our desire. Inevitably, we experience frustration, anger, loss, unhappiness, and dissatisfaction. Life is in constant change, and changes such as birth, old age, sickness, and death can bring dissatisfaction or suffering. Suffering may arise from being associated with people or conditions that are unpleasant, from being separated from people we love or conditions we enjoy, from not getting what we desire, or from getting what we desire then losing it. Even our own thoughts and feelings are impermanent, constantly changing. Inevitably, all physical, emotional, and mental conditions will change. The second noble truth refers to the arising, origin, 
and cause of our dissatisfaction and suffering. We desire, crave, and thirst for happiness, security, and identity in this world of impermanence. Influenced by our misperception, ignorance slash delusion, we want life to satisfy our every craving, need, and desire. We want from life what it can never provide, constant happiness, pleasure, and security undisturbed by change or loss. When life fails to satisfy our needs and desires, we experience fear, frustration, hurt, anger, pain, or suffering. Afflicted by such thoughts and emotions, we tend to speak and act in negative ways which cause further suffering. Therefore our dissatisfaction and suffering do not come from outside of ourselves. We cause our own suffering when we fail to realize that the impermanent nature of life is incapable of providing constant satisfaction for our craving, need, and desire. The origin and cause of dissatisfaction and suffering is our misperception of reality, ignorance slash delusion, self-centered desire, greed, craving, grasping, attachment to things that do not last, and our negative behavior. The third noble truth tells us there is an end to our dissatisfaction and suffering when we let go of, abandon, and liberate ourselves from the craving and attachment that causes it. Because our pain, confusion, and suffering have a cause, a beginning they also have an end. Once we understand the nature of our illness, we can cure it with the right remedies. In this same way, once we see and understand what causes our suffering, we can bring an end to it by eliminating those causes and realizing well-being. Liberation from the suffering, awakening, supreme peace, lasting happiness, and perfect wisdom are possible. These qualities are the very essence and nature of our being. They are always available within us, awaiting our realization. The fourth noble truth is the way, the path, leading to the end of dissatisfaction and suffering. By following and practicing the noble eightfold path which consists of the right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, we will overcome our dissatisfaction and suffering. Following this path, also known as the noble middle path, we avoid the extremes of searching for happiness through a life of indulgence in desire and sensual pleasure, or the opposite extreme of trying to gain happiness or liberation by tormenting one's body and mind through unreasonable, unprofitable, and painful forms of spiritual austerity, self-mortification. The Noble Eightfold Path is the way to the end of suffering, the middle way that leads to peace, discernment, supreme happiness, perfect wisdom, enlightenment, and nirvana. Choji M. Trungpa in his book The Truth of Suffering and the Path of Liberation lists the eight types of suffering as follows. 1. The suffering of birth. 2. The suffering of old age. 3. The suffering of illness. 4. The suffering of death. 5. The suffering of encountering what is unpleasant. 6. The suffering of separation from what is pleasant. 7. The suffering of not getting what one wants. 8. The suffering of the five appropriated aggregates or general misery. He then organizes these eight types of suffering within three types of suffering, or three patterns, as follows. 1. Suffering of suffering, birth, old age, sickness, death, coming across what is not desirable. 2. Suffering of change, not being able to hold on to what is desirable, not getting what we want. 3. All pervasive suffering, general misery. In Lama Tsongkhapa's great stages of the path, the eight types of suffering are explained thoroughly. The five aggregates lead to the Buddhist analysis of personal experience or the Buddhist analysis of the personality. The analysis of personal experience follows along two lines, one, with regard to the body, and, two, with regard to the mind. The concept of self is a convenient term for a collection of physical and mental factors, in the same way that the word forest is a convenient term for a collection of trees. Please view your handout to look over this chart. Three Marks of Existence If we contemplate even a minute sector of the vast range of life, we are faced with such a tremendous variety of life's manifestations that it defeats description. And yet, three basic statements can be made that are valid for all animate existence from the microbe up to the creative mind of a human genius. These three basic facts of all existence are 1. Impermanence or change, called inika. 2. Suffering or unsatisfactoriness, called dukkha. 3. Not self or insubstantiality, called inidya. In English renderings, they are also sometimes called signs, signata, 
or marks. The three marks are common to all that is conditioned, even to what is below or beyond the normal range of human perception. To see things as they really are means seeing them consistently in the light of the three characteristics. Ignorance of these three, or self-deception about them, is by itself a potent cause for suffering. In Buddhist teachings, greed, hatred, and delusion are known, for good reason, as the three poisons, the three unwholesome roots, and the three fires. These metaphors suggest how dangerous afflictive thoughts and emotions can be if they are not understood and transformed. Greed refers to our selfishness, misplaced desire, attachment, and grasping for happiness and satisfaction outside of ourselves. Hatred refers to our anger, our aversion and repulsion toward unpleasant people, circumstances, and even toward our own uncomfortable feelings. Delusion refers to our dullness, bewilderment, and misperception our wrong views of reality. The sixteen defilements are finally abandoned by the noble paths, or stages of sanctity, in the following order. By the path of stream entry, or soda patti maga, which include denigration, domineering, envy, jealousy, hypocrisy, fraud. By the path of non-returning, or anagami maga, which include ill will, anger, malice, negligence. By the path of arahantship, or arahatamaga, which include covetousness and unrighteous greed, obstinacy, presumption, conceit, arrogance, vanity. It was said by the Enlightened One, this mind, monks, is luminous, but it becomes soiled by adventitious defilements but by cleansing it one can make it more luminous, and effort therein is not in vain. Several common difficulties exist in practicing meditation. These are often referred to as the five hindrances, and are the characteristics that make it difficult to keep a regular practice. They are hindrances because they divert, as well as sap our strength and ability to work in an optimal way. Our minds can have the strength and speed of a great river, and the radiance, purity, and flexibility of the purest gold, if we work steadfastly to vanquish the hindrances. Ten non-virtuous actions include Actions of body such as killing, hatred, stealing, desire, or sexual misconduct such as rape, adultery, promiscuity, and sexual addiction. Actions of speech such as lying or misleading, divisive speech intending to break up a friendship between people, intention to belittle, embarrass, or upset someone, and idle gossip. Actions of mind such as craving or desiring to possess what one doesn't have, aversion, taking delight in the misfortune of others, actively wanting others to suffer, delusion, and actively denying the reality of things that are true. For example, denying the karmic law of cause and effect. The eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are not steps to be followed in sequence, one after another. They can be more aptly described as components rather than as steps, comparable to the intertwining strands of a single cable that requires the contributions of all the strands for maximum strength. With a certain degree of progress, all eight factors can be present simultaneously, each supporting the others. However, until that point is reached, some sequence in the unfolding of the path is inevitable. Considered from the standpoint of practical training, the eight path factors divide into three groups. 1. The moral discipline group, Silak Khanda, made up of right speech, right action, and right livelihood. 2. The concentration group, Samadhik Khanda, made up of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, and 3. The wisdom group, Panak Khanda, made up of right view and right intention. These three groups represent three stages of training, the training in the higher moral discipline, the training in the higher consciousness, and the training in the higher wisdom. Cause and Effect, A Universal Law The following verses from the Dhammapada illustrate the universal law of cause and effect, a law that influences all of life, commonly expressed in the words what goes around, comes around. He suffers in this world, and he suffers in the next world. The man who does evil suffers in both worlds. He suffers, he suffers and mourns when he sees the wrong he has done. The Dhammapada, Contrary Ways, page 15. He is happy in this world, and he is happy in the next world. The man who does good is happy in both worlds. He is glad, he feels great gladness when he sees the good he has done. The Dhammapada, Contrary Ways, page 16. If a man does something wrong, let him not do it again and again. Let him not find pleasure in his sin. Painful is the accumulation of wrongdoings. The Dhammapada, Good and Evil, 
page 117. If a man does something good, let him do it again and again. Let him find joy in his good work. Joyful is the accumulation of good work. The Dhammapada, Good and Evil, page 118. He who for the sake of happiness does not hurt others who also want happiness, shall hereafter find happiness. The Dhammapada, Life, page 132. Never speak harsh words, for once spoken they may return to you. Angry words are painful and there may be blows for blows. The Dhammapada, Life, page 133. It is mental volition, O monks, that I call karma. Having willed, one acts through body, speech or mind. The Buddha. Karma is a very important subject, one which we should understand clearly. Karma is not a concept or a theory, karma is a natural law of the universe. Comprehending karma is the right understanding, or right view, of Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path. What is karma? It is essential to understand karma as a foundation for our behavior, for our dharma practice, and for the quality of our lives as a whole. The Sanskrit word karma means action. This refers to intentional physical, verbal, or mental actions. Karma is directly related to our intention or motivation while doing an action. Very simply, we receive what we give, we harvest exactly what we plant. Our actions, whether they are positive or negative, virtuous or non-virtuous, leave imprints or seeds in our minds, and these imprints ripen into our life experiences when the appropriate conditions come together. The seeds of our actions continue with us from one lifetime to the next and do not get lost. Our relationship to karma is very simple, we are the actual product of our karma. We are the product of every thought, feeling, word, and action from our past and we will be the product of our karma in the future as well. The following contemplations were offered by the Buddha in the Upanjatana Sutta. I am the owner of my actions, karma, heir to my actions, born from my actions, related through my actions, and have my actions as my judge. Whatever I do, for good or for evil, that I will inherit. The Four Laws of Karma 1. Results are similar to the cause. Karma and its results are certain and unfailing. Positive actions of body, speech, and mind will always bring the positive result of some form of happiness and benefit. Negative actions of body, speech, and mind will always bring the negative result of some form of suffering. 2. No results come without a cause. Actions not engaged, will not bring results. Things do not just appear out of nothing. If the cause has not been created, the effect will not be experienced. 3. Once an action is done, the result is never lost. 4. Karma expands. Once we have an imprint of an action in our mind, it tends to be habit forming. Some people misunderstand the concept of karma. They take the Buddha's doctrine of the law of causality to mean that all is predetermined, that there is nothing that the individual can do. This is a total misunderstanding. The very term karma or action is a term of active force, which indicates that future events are within your own hands. Since action is a phenomenon that is committed by a person, a living being, it is within your own hands whether or not you engage in action. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, from his book, Path to Bliss. To change our karma, we need to understand the unwholesome, negative, and non-virtuous actions that bring pain, unhappiness and suffering. We also need to understand the wholesome, positive, and virtuous actions that bring benefit and happiness. The rest is diligent practice. By practicing the essential foundation of the Buddhist path, morality, personal integrity, we will transform our karma and our life experiences. By understanding the Four Noble Truths and following the Noble Eightfold Path we will transform our karma. By practicing the Six Paramitas, perfections, we will transform our karma. By cultivating positive, virtuous thoughts, feelings, words, and actions, exercising compassion, loving-kindness, and wisdom in our daily lives, we will transform our karma. By way of this practice, we will change the entire course of our life experience and move swiftly toward liberation. The purification practices we find in Buddhist teachings are similar to those in many other religions. The most essential factor that one requires is sincerity or honesty with oneself. When we want to purify past negative karma, we must apply ourselves to engaging in all actions with the correct motivation and by using the following four powers of purification. 1. Power of the object, 
one should practice remembering and thinking of all sentient beings one may have hurt. 2. Power of regret, one realizes soberly, what I did was wrong and negative. One regrets having committed that action and feels this regret in their heart. What is intended here is to examine oneself and one's actions and to truly recognize that negative actions done in the past were very unwise. 3. Power of promise or remedy, as a logical consequence of the above, one should promise not to repeat these negative actions and apply oneself diligently to doing virtuous actions in order to counteract the negative ones. It can be helpful to at least promise oneself to avoid a negative behavior for a specific period of time. Not being honest at this stage makes the practice useless or even harmful to oneself. 4. Power of practice, basically any positive action with a good motivation can be used. Traditionally in Buddhism one can use practices such as prostrations, as a means to destroy pride, making offerings, to counteract greed, reading Buddhist texts, to counteract ignorance and negative thoughts, and acts of kindness to cultivate a heart of compassion, and so forth. The Buddha's teaching of meditation aims at producing a state of perfect mental health, equilibrium, and tranquility. In reality, the word meditation is a very poor substitute for the original term bhavana, which means culture or development, that is, mental culture or mental development. It aims at cleansing the mind of impurities and disturbances, such as lustful desires, hatred, ill will, indolence, worries and restlessness, and skeptical doubts. It aims at cultivating such qualities as concentration, awareness, intelligence, will, energy, the analytical faculty, confidence, joy, tranquility, leading finally to the attainment of highest wisdom which sees the nature of things as they are, and realizes the ultimate truth, nirvana. This chart is included in your handout. Loving Kindness Meditation May all beings be happy and peaceful. Free from suffering and distress. May all beings be safe and secure. Free from fear and harm. May all beings be healthy and prosperous. Free from pain, illness, and lack. May all beings live joyfully and with ease. Free from struggle and conflict. This excellent meditation derives from the discourse on loving kindness given by the Buddha 2600 years ago. The loving kindness he spoke of then is still the deepest need of the world today. The Pali word meta means universal loving kindness, friendliness, and goodwill free from expectation and possessiveness. However, this is not the ordinary, sensual, emotional, or sentimental kind of love that most people commonly express. Meta has a far greater significance than this. Meta is an all embracing love, a sincere desire for the happiness and well being of others. Meta is without any selectivity or exclusion. If we select a few people we love and exclude someone we do not like, this is a lack of understanding of metta. With the sublime heart of love, we express care and concern for all beings through benevolent thoughts, feelings, and words, as well as through selfless acts of kindness and generosity. How does this relate to psychotherapy? Buddhism has the notion of mental afflictions, which are states of mind that prevent us from perceiving reality. Mental afflictions, for example, hatred, don't prevent us from perceiving reality, but rather distort that perception. Cognitive psychology tells us much the same thing, when we are in the grip of a strong negative emotion like hatred, it skews memory, we remember things we hate about the other far more readily than what we might like, selective attention, what becomes most salient are any cues for what we dislike, etc. The Buddhist view holds that such states are afflictive because they distort our perception of reality and they create an inner disequilibrium. On the other hand, the Western consensual definition of what makes an emotion destructive is that no matter the emotion it leads us to do something that harms ourselves or others. The Buddhist view can be seen as dealing with more subtle levels of destructiveness. The notion of an empty self posits that there is no CEO of the mind, but rather something like committees constantly vying for power. In this view, the self is not a stable, enduring entity in control, but rather a mirage of the mind, not actually real but merely seemingly so. While that notion seems contrary to our own everyday experience, it actually describes the deconstruction of self that cognitive neuroscience finds as it dissects the mind, most famously, Marvin Minsky's Society of Mind. So the Buddhist model of the self may turn out to fit the data far better than the notions that have dominated Western thinking for the last century. Shonen et al. refer to BDI-Buddhist-derived interventions, or mixing Buddhist philosophy with clinical interventions. 
They cautioned there is also no model to guide psychologists in correctly integrating Buddhist concepts into treatment. As a result, some psychologists may be incorrectly incorporating Buddhist concepts into their work, causing confusion and or harm. Thus, before you incorporate these kinds of practices into your clinical work, do some reading and talk to some Buddhists. Buddhist psychotherapy is a contemporary Western descriptor of a range of Buddhist-influenced psychotherapy practices that Buddhist psychiatrists, psychologists and psychotherapists have developed out of their meeting with Buddhism and their particular mental health field. Buddhist psychotherapy is based on the Buddhist model of the cause of mental suffering, the noble fourfold truths, and the notions of attachment, permanence and clinging to notions of self as the perpetrating forces of mental suffering. Buddhist psychotherapists use a range of Buddhist-inspired practices to alleviate mental suffering these include insight and mindfulness meditation practices, as well as practices in compassion and loving-kindness meditation. There is a strong commitment to empowering the client to become aware of processes that create mental suffering in those activities and processes which alleviate mental suffering. The Buddhist tradition has always been focused on the meaning of our lives, the causes of suffering, and what we can do about suffering. Thus, it is compatible with psychology in a broad sense. Wallace et al. offer several insights of Buddhism using happiness. Wallace et al. note that people who win the lottery are happier for a short time, and then return to their prior levels of happiness, despite having access to more possessions and such. Some researchers divide people into maximizers, who are always looking for the maximum happiness, and satisfieds, who are content with what they have. Because the first focus on what they are missing, they are never really happy with what they have because they keep watching for something better. Because the second are satisfied with what they have, they enjoy it. Mental balance as described by Wallace et al. includes four areas. Cognitive includes setting priorities and goals with intention and persistence, with motivation. Theories of therapeutic change include that this is required for healthy growth. For example think about the difference between saying I really need to go to the gym and getting a membership and actually going to the gym, even when you are tired, carrying your gym stuff is a hassle, the weather is bad. A healthy person, or person in balance, would be working toward their own and others' well-being, which would require reflecting on their goals, and considering what would happen if they reached them. They would understand the impermanence of life, remain detached from external things to curb cravings and desires and thus experience contentment. An unhealthy person, or person out of balance, might have little motivation or imagination, be apathetic, and despair, or they might also be overly fixated on some things, driven to excess and to achieve no matter the cost, or addicted. Attention includes focus on priorities and goals in daily life. Attention or vigilance means noticing that you have started to wander. We like to say our mind wanders, but our mind is not separate from us, really. We are the one doing the wandering. After we wander off, we will ourselves to return to the trail. This is not trying to suppress or push away distracting thoughts. Rather, we calmly and simply let go of the distractions. Mindfulness is not never wandering off, but rather having the focus to try to stay on the trail, the attention to see you are off it, and the will to return to it. In the West, attention has sometimes been thought of as flow or being in the zone. This is what Wegola calls brilliant sanity, or moments of being completely and fully present there and then. A healthy person or person in balance would be able to direct their attention to the present moment, the people and events going on right in front of them. Sometimes they would simply enjoy the moment. At others times, they would catch themselves disengaging to worry, resent, judge, and prompt themselves to re-engage without such judgments and demands. They could then engage the world in a non-judgmental way and share the calm with others. An unhealthy person or person out of balance would struggle to be present in the moments of life. Their worries, fears, conflicts, past hurts, would be like distractions that constantly entice them to leave the trail, wander away from what was happening right in front of them to an unhappy place. Thus, they would have mostly unhappy and distressing things to share with others. Cognitive includes clear thinking and reasoning about ourselves and the world around us. Westerners tend to see the self as a stable thing, while it does develop and change, it does so in understandable and predictable ways. Shonen et al. discuss the non-self, or idea that what we Westerners think of as the self, doesn't really exist. We are one thing one minute and another thing the next minute. 
we are one thing in one setting or system, and something different in another setting or system. We are impermanent. One Buddhist idea is that the cause of suffering is making the impermanent permanent. A healthy person and an unhealthy person sound permanent, stable, continual. A person in balance and a person out of balance seem to imply that either could change. Being in balance takes work, and so is not something to take for granted. Being out of balance, well that requires work too, but the point is that this state can change too. Another idea of Buddhists is that suffering comes from not accepting the world as it is but instead focusing on how we would have it. By doing this, we perceive the world in terms of how we expect it to work. When the world doesn't behave as we expect, which it will do because it is an imperfect, impermanent, sometimes chaotic place, we get upset. Narrative therapists liken this to having a map of the land around us, and using the map to guide us, rather than just looking at the land. If it is a very, very good map, we may be fine. However, we will eventually come to something not on the map. We then can become upset that something is not on the map, instead of dealing with what is literally in front of us. Shonen et al. note this is a difficult concept. Are we stable, permanent, predictable beings, or unstable, impermanent, unpredictable beings? If you think about it, the first view means we should be able to reduce all human behavior and experience down to a mathematical formula, because we are easy to predict. The second though would mean we can't predict what people will do, and so it is pointless to predict. We like to at least think of ourselves as being somewhere in the middle. Interestingly, Buddha took what he called the middle way. He did not endorse asceticism and denying oneself of all worldly pleasures and Buddha did not endorse hedonism and seeking pleasure. Rather, he sought a middle course, a way to be in the world without being defined by it. This is also a way that Buddhist ideas can be brought into treatment of trauma victims. We say I am traumatized or I am a victim or I am hurt. M is like an equal sign in a mathematical equation. I is on one side of the equation, while their pain is on the other side. The equal sign means I and trauma or victim or pain are the same thing. This is why Wilson proposes that language causes suffering. When we send and receive messages like you should be happy or don't say that or stop being a baby or you never could do this we record these messages with language and replay them in our minds. This takes us away from the present moment, from whatever is really happening for that moment. These messages prompt us to focus our thoughts on some past or future moment, to continually judge our current behavior by some set of rules or expectations, or to struggle to permanently deny the impermanent is real for that moment. One way to describe what therapists do is to say we tell people that they are not what they think they are. They are not the pain or the trauma, they can feel these things, talk about these things, remember these things here and now. And yet they can still be something very different from that pain and trauma. The problem is, they have forgotten that, or forgotten who they really were before, during, and now after their trauma. As Shonen et al. wrote, this kind of thinking can be a very freeing concept, but delivered at the wrong time or in the wrong way can be a hurtful one. It can feel as though we are dismissing people's experiences and pain. A healthy person or person in balance would be able to know the present moment without judging. If you prefer, it is seeing the person and the moment as they are, rather than classifying them and sorting them into boxes and categories. An unhealthy person or person out of balance might go from moment to moment without being aware which gives the word absent-minded a new meaning. They might be too caught up in their racing thoughts, obsessive worries, or misperceive reality around them and become consumed with that, or constantly struggle with making sense of why the world is not what they believe it ought to be. Affective includes a sense of calm and emotionally stability or regulation. This is achieved in part through detachment. In the West, we think of attachment as a requirement for healthy development. The Buddhist model, however, sees attachment as investing energy in people, things, experiences, etc. that do not warrant this attention. An interaction with another person may bring you happiness, and you can enjoy that in the moment. However, you can't expect all interactions with that person to bring you happiness, or that most of your happy interactions in life would be with that person. This would be putting too much energy into this relationship and becoming attached to something that will not last. Pema Chodron suggests that when you meditate, you can use the mantra calm, peaceful, abiding meaning you are focused on reminding yourself to be emotionally calm, peaceful rather than tense and in conflict, and abiding or accepting of the world and people in it for what they, are each moment. This, 
she says, leads to great patience. Shown in et al. offer this idea of equanimity. By seeing the interconnections between people and the world, people no longer are really that important. When something, plants, animals, people, die, it decomposes and provides nutrients for other living things. When something is burned it is destroyed, but the destruction of one thing leaves room for the creation of another thing. It's all part of a whole, so everything is part of the interconnected system. Thus, being kind to someone is being kind to yourself, and being angry with them is being angry with yourself. Thinking this way can allow for great compassion or empathy for others suffering as part of the human condition, part of our own condition, and then offering caring for others without an expectation of a return for us. It allows for kindness that is selfless, and given to enemies and friends alike, since they are both really parts of the larger system, just like me. It can also allow for great generosity or wishing them well-being, or acting to support their well-being, just as much as you would wish that for yourself. If this seems odd, think about the saying, hating someone is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick or the people who really annoy you can teach you something about yourself. A healthy person or person in balance would be mindful as they move through daily life, would feel compassion and kindness toward others, act with equanimity and try to cultivate emotional stability or detachment from the various ups and downs of life. An unhealthy person or person out of balance would struggle with this. Feelings of stress and anxiety, judgments of failure and inadequacy, would lead them to feel like a boat in a storm, pulled and pushed one way and then another. This makes it hard to be compassionate and patient, and to accept the world and people in it the way they are. A concern with a middle way, or with being balanced is not unique to Buddhism. It is also a part of the common sense of our own culture. Although lay wisdom includes a middle way approach, it also includes other approaches, exemplified by phrases such as go for the max, pull out all of the stops and crash through or crash, that are not consistent with a middle way approach. Within Buddhism, the middle way is given a more central place, and is drawn from more consistently. A middle way approach to therapy can deal with the pervasive tendency to polarize and swing between two unsustainable extremes. Shonen et al. say 25% of British people report they meditate, while only 6.5% of American people say the same. As the Dalai Lama and Thichin Hadhan have both won Nobel Peace Prizes, maybe people in America are just a little behind the times? At another level, there is neurological data showing that regular meditation results in positive brain changes and growth in gray matter. As a result, Buddhist practices could be seen as health-maintaining behaviors that are becoming more popular. Mind is the forerunner of all, evil, conditions. Mind is their chief, and they are mind made. If, with an impure mind, one speaks or acts, then suffering follows one. Even as the cartwheel follows the hoof of the ox. Mind is the forerunner of all, good, conditions. Mind is their chief, and they are mind made. If, with a pure mind, one speaks or acts, then happiness follows one like a never-departing shadow. These are the opening lines of the Dhammapada. They illustrate the central theme of Buddhist teaching, the human mind. If the basis of Christianity is God, the basis of Buddhism is mind. From the Buddhist viewpoint, mind or consciousness is the core of our existence. Pleasure and pain, good and evil, time and space, life and death have no meaning to us apart from our awareness of them or thoughts about them. Whether God exists or does not exist, whether existence is primarily spiritual or primarily material, whether we live for a few decades or live forever all these matters are, in the Buddhist view, secondary to the one empirical fact of which we do have certainty, the existence of conscious experience as it proceeds through the course of daily living. Therefore Buddhism focuses on the mind, for happiness and sorrow, pleasure and pain are psychological experiences. Even such notions as purpose, value, virtue, goodness, and worth have meaning only as the result of our attitudes and feelings. If the cause of suffering is primarily psychological, then it must follow that the cure, also, is psychological. Therefore, we find in Buddhism a series of mental exercises or meditations designed to uncover and cure our psychic aberrations. Meditation, therefore, is a really practical occupation, it is in no sense necessarily a religious one, though it is usually thought of as such. Reading about meditation is like reading about swimming, only by getting into the water does the aspiring swimmer begin to progress. 
so it is with meditation and Buddhism in general. Study and contemplation are valuable tools, but life itself is the training ground. As we gain an experience and self-understanding, and as we acquire full appreciation for the nature and quality of our own feelings, we find that the positive feelings are satisfying, meaningful, and wholesome experiences in and of themselves. That is, they have their own inherent worth and intrinsic value independent of any world view or religious dogma. Conversely, greed, hatred, lust, etc. are agitating, discomforting experiences which when present preclude a full realization of the happiness born of love and equanimity. Thus the realization of positive feelings and relinquishment of negative feelings are the major goals and motivations of meditation. It is virtually impossible for a busy person with manifold worldly ambitions to suddenly and voluntarily quiet his mind to the point of removing all discursive thoughts. In a matter of minutes, if not seconds, the meditator will find himself either planning, reminiscing, or daydreaming. Therefore, before one begins meditation, some amount of moral development and self-discipline should be achieved. In 1963 a report on Zen meditation was presented by Dr. Kasmatsu and Dr. Harai of the Department of Neuropsychiatry at Tokyo University. It contained the results of a 10-year study of the brainwave or electroencephalographic EEG, tracings of Zen masters. The egg tracings revealed that about 90 seconds after an accomplished Zen practitioner begins meditation, a rhythmic slowing in the brainwave pattern known as alpha waves occurs. This slowing occurs with eyes open and progresses with meditation, and after 30 minutes one finds rhythmic alpha waves of 7 or 8 per second. This effect persists for some minutes after meditation. What is most significant is that this egg pattern is notably different from those of sleep, normal waking consciousness, and hypnotic trance, and is unusual in persons who have not made considerable progress in meditation. In other words, it suggests an unusual mental state. Another finding of the same study concerned what is called alpha blocking and habituation. In a Zen master the alpha blocking produced by the first noise lasts only 2 seconds. If the noise is repeated at 15 second intervals, we find that in the normal subject there is virtually no alpha blocking remaining by the fifth successive noise. This diminution of alpha blocking is termed habituation and persists in normal subjects for as long as the noise continues at regular and frequent intervals. In the Zen master, however, no habituation is seen. His alpha blocking lasts two seconds with the first sound, two seconds with the fifth sound, and two seconds with the twentieth sound. This implies that the Zen master has a greater awareness of his environment as the paradoxical result of meditative concentration. A comparison of two EEG studies showed that yogis in meditation are oblivious to the external world, while Zen meditators become keenly attuned to the environment. Thus, Different forms of meditation are associated with different patterns of brain activity and different forms of attention. The distinctions between various forms of meditation such as transcendental meditation and vipassana are significant because they enable us to recognize that a meditation technique may appropriately be applied in therapy only if it matches the therapeutic goals being sought, for example, stress reduction, working through difficult emotions, or seeking transformative transpersonal experiences. Through science, technology, and social organization Western man has built a civilization of unprecedented wealth and grandeur. Yet despite this mastery of his environment, he has given little thought to mastery of himself. In fact, his newly acquired wealth and leisure have heightened his sensuality and weakened his self-discipline. It becomes increasingly apparent, however, that a stable and prosperous democracy can endure only so long as we have intelligent, self-disciplined, and properly motivated citizens. Legislation and education alone will not ensure this. Buddhism presents a technique by which this can be obtained, but the responsibility rests with each individual. No one can cure our neuroses and strengthen our characters except ourselves. The Buddha once said, I shall protect myself, in that way the foundations of mindfulness should be practiced. I shall protect others, in that way the foundations of mindfulness should be practiced. Protecting oneself one protects others protecting others one protects oneself. And how does one, in protecting oneself, protect others? By the repeated and frequent practice of meditation. And how does one, in protecting others, protect oneself? By patience and forbearance, by non-violent and harmless life, by loving kindness and compassion. I shall protect myself, in that way the foundations of mindfulness should be practiced. I shall protect others, 
in that way the foundations of mindfulness should be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others, protecting others, one protects oneself. Meditation and Psychotherapy, a review of the literature. There are many forms of meditation that have been developed and passed on by humanity's religious and spiritual traditions. Many involve some form of withdrawal of attention from the outer world and from customary patterns of perceptual, cognitive, emotional, and motor activity, performed in a state of inner and outer stillness. There are, however, forms of meditation that utilize music, movement, or visual or auditory contemplation of physical objects or processes such as staring at a candle flame, watching or listening to a stream of water or ocean waves. Goleman divides meditation into two main categories, concentration methods and insight techniques. Concentrative meditation fixes the mind on a single object such as the breath or a mantra and attempts to exclude all other thoughts from awareness. This kind of meditation is prescribed in the Yoga Sutras and Buddhism, and has been popularized in the form of transcendental meditation. Concentration practices suppress ordinary mental functioning, restrict attention to one point and induce states of absorption characterized by tranquility and bliss. Buddhism, however, also introduced the practice of insight meditation, or vipassana, the goal of which is insight into the nature of psychic functioning, not the achievement of states of absorption. Vipassana is a training in mindfulness in which attention is focused upon registering feelings, thoughts, and sensations exactly as they occur, without elaboration, preference, selection, comments, censorship, judgment, or interpretation. It is a process of expanding attention to as many mental and physical events as possible, the goal of which is understanding of the impermanent, unsatisfactory, and non-substantial nature of all phenomena. Detheridge studied the effectiveness of meditation techniques as a primary or secondary technique with a variety of psychiatric patients. He conceptualized meditation as a self-treatment regimen something which highly efficient for the use of the therapist's time and therefore quite cost-effective. He also saw it helps patients know their own mental processes and preoccupations, develop the observer self, and gain the ability to shape or control their mental processes. Carpenter writes, Meditation and esoteric traditions have much to offer psychotherapy, and suggests that the efficacy of meditation in therapy is due to a combination of relaxation, cognitive and attentional restructuring, self-observation, and insight. Shapiro and Jiber discuss two main hypotheses regarding the mechanisms responsible for the therapeutic benefits of meditation, first, the view that meditation brings about a state of relaxation, and secondly, the view that meditation is effective by inducing an altered state of consciousness. Diekman argues that Western psychology has much to learn from the traditions of mystical sciences, which claim that central sources of human suffering originate in ignorance of our true nature and that achieving enlightenment, or the experience of the real self alleviates human suffering by removing its basis. Western therapy, he writes, focuses on emotions, thoughts, memories, impulses, images, self-concepts, all of which are contents of consciousness. But Western psychology fails to concern itself with the fact that our core sense of personal existence what Diekman calls the observing self is located in awareness itself, not in its contents. Thus awareness remains beyond thought and images, memories, and feelings, and cannot be observed, but must be experienced directly. Meditative techniques heighten awareness of the observing self, change customary patterns of perception and thinking, and change motivation, lessening the intensity of motivations connected with the ego, the object self, leading to reduction of symptom. In Diekman's view, meditation is an adjunct to therapy, not a replacement for it. Therapy is most helpful for persons seeking relief from symptoms interfering with work, intimacy and pleasure. Therapy ameliorates neurotic self-centeredness, corrects misinterpretations of the world, and teaches new strategies that are more effective in meeting a person's needs. Western therapy focuses on fulfillment of personal desires, the gratification of the object self. Cuts, Borisenko, and Benson state that meditation may be a primer for therapy for observing and categorizing mental events provides insight into how mental schemes are created, giving rise to a greater sense of responsibility and allowing one to step out of conceptual limitations and stereotyped reactions and behaviors. Meditation spurs the desire for deeper self-understanding through therapy, and actually leads, in their view, to an intensification of the therapeutic process. 
Meditation is a form of introspection pursued outside of the therapeutic session, for which patients pay with their own time, not the therapist's time. Thus meditation enhances the quality of therapy by involving patients more deeply in the process of self-exploration and providing abundant material for exploration in therapy sessions. They argue that combining meditation and therapy is technically compatible and mutually reinforcing. Bakker suggested that a sequential approach in which psychotherapy precedes meditation is more beneficial than a blended approach. It is important to respect the developmental tasks of the person emphasized by existential humanistic therapy. Self-identification, emotional contact and expression, ego development, and increase in self-esteem are all necessary before the individual can undertake in a serious way the tasks of meditation, the disidentification from emotional and egoic concerns. Meditation teaches the skills of attention and a still mind, a state of inner harmony and a transformation and transcendence of the personal concerns that are the focus of psychotherapy. Vaughn lists the following components common to both therapy and meditation telling the truth, releasing negative emotions, the need for effort and consistency, authenticity and trust avoiding self-deception, integrity and wholeness accepting all one's experiences and allowing things to be as they are, rather than living in a world of illusion and denial, insight and forgiveness directed toward oneself and others, opening the heart and developing the capacity to give and receive love, awareness and non-judgmental attention, liberation from limiting self-concepts, from fear and delusion and from the past and early conditioning. Ka Ehrenfield contends that Western therapy emphasizes analysis, investigation and the adjustment of the personality. Yet it neglects the development of concentration, tranquility, and equanimity, the cutting power of samadhi, the stillness of the mind in meditation that can penetrate the surface of the mind and empower the awareness to cut neurotic speed. Meditation, in his view, is a means not merely of seeking comfort and stability but of working with inner turmoil and undergoing a profound transformation that represents the death of the self that is the main focus of attention in psychotherapy. However Ka Ehrenfield also emphasizes that meditation doesn't do it all. In many areas, he writes, such as grief, communication skills, maturation of relationships, sexuality and intimacy, career and work issues, fears and phobias, and early wounds, Western therapy is quicker and more successful than meditation. Odanjnik writes that meditation teaches a focused attention that leads to increased self-awareness of mental and emotional states, mastery over instinctive, compulsive reactions, insight into one's true nature and into reality, exploration of religious themes, images, and feelings, and expansion of ego consciousness into a more universal consciousness. Brooks and Scarano studied the effectiveness of transcendental meditation in the treatment of post-Vietnam adjustment, concluding that it is a useful treatment modality. After three months of meditation, treatment subjects showed significant reductions in depression, anxiety, emotional numbness, alcohol consumption, family problems, difficulty in finding a job, insomnia, and other symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Therapy subjects in the same study showed no significant improvement on any measure. Many of the clinical benefits claimed for meditation are attributed to the physiological state of relaxation associated with meditation. Studies have found that meditation leads to significant decreases in oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide elimination, respiration rate, cardiac output, heart rate, arterial lactate concentration, respiratory quotient, blood pressure, arterial gases, and body temperature. Meditation is also associated with increases in skin resistance and in slow alpha brain waves and a decrease of beta waves. All of these physiological correlates of meditation yield a portrait of a condition of relaxed wakefulness. This has given rise to the view that meditation is basically a relaxation technique, one which allows a calm witnessing of thoughts and reduces somatic symptoms, fears, and phobias through desensitization and reduction of anxiety. The relaxation model of meditation's therapeutic effectiveness is usually associated with the theory of reciprocal inhibition. Wolpe hypothesized that a phobic reaction would extinguish if it could symbolically occur in the presence of an incompatible response, such as relaxation. This is the foundation of modern behavioral self-control strategies. Meditation from a Cognitive Perspective Bowles and Diekman prefer a cognitive explanation of meditation, viewing it as a process of deliberately altering attention, involving a change of focus from the external world to the inner world, from stimulus variety to stimulus uniformity 
from the active mode of consciousness characterized by focal attention, control, task orientation, manipulation of the environment to the receptive mode characterized by diffuse attention and letting go. The cognitive changes resulting from meditation can perhaps best be understood using Diekman's concept of the automatization of consciousness, brought about by reinvesting actions and percepts with attention. Diekman calls automatization a process of cutting away false cognitive certainties, leading to mystical experiences and unusual modes of perception. Meditation produces a change in internal state that maximizes the possibility for flow experiences while lessening the need to control the environment. Meditation thus leads to perceptual sharpening and increased ability to attend to a target environmental stimulus while ignoring irrelevant stimuli. Another useful cognitive model is found in Del Monte's constructivist approach to meditation based on George Kelly's personal construct theory, PCT. According to Kelly, there are two fundamental realities, the reality beyond human perception, and our interpretations or constructions of this primary reality, which are constantly updated in the light of new evidence. Both PCT and Eastern psychologies such as Buddhism agree that normal human understanding involves use of dualistic constructions to make sense of a unitary reality. Buddhism emphasizes the need to see through the illusion of duality through meditation, to recognize the transparency of our construct system, and to experience a greater sense of unity, whereas PCT emphasizes the practical value of dualistic construing and the importance of elaborating ever more effective personal construct systems to more accurately predict events. Del Monte's model suggests that the process of attentional retraining involved in meditation can be beneficial in three distinctive ways, it can be applied in a pragmatic way to change human behavior by augmenting and improving our personal construct systems, ascendance to facilitate the accessing of unconscious material, previously inaccessible from within our construct system, descendants, and to bring about altered states of consciousness in which one experiences, at least temporarily, the free space of reality beyond and prior to our construct systems. Meditation and the Unconscious, Psychoanalytic and Buddhist Perspectives Cuts et al. Write that meditation leads to greater cognitive flexibility which allows one to perceive connections between sets of psychological contents that were hitherto separate and unrelated. In this manner, they contend, meditation loosens defenses and allows the emergence of repressed material. Both meditation and free association involve self-observation, although one is usually discouraged from trying to interpret the meaning of free associations during meditation. Meditation-related free associations are usually available to memory and like dreams, can be brought into therapy and understood by examining their origin and meaning. The view that meditation may be a useful means of uncovering unconscious material is not shared by some within the psychoanalytic tradition who view meditation as regressive or pathological. Freud considered all forms of religious experiences as attempts to return to the most primitive stages of ego development, a restoration of limitless narcissism, used as a defense against the fears of separateness. Epstein and Leaf emphasize that meditation may be used in both adaptive and regressive ways. They stress that some meditators need a therapeutic framework in which to work out the unresolved unconscious issues which may emerge in the form of an upsurge of fantasies, daydreams, precognitive mental processes, or visual, auditory, or somatic aberrations during meditation. Like therapy, vipassana meditation is an uncovering technique, characterized by neutrality, removal of censorship observation and abstinence from gratification of wishes, impulses, or desires, and discouragement of abreaction, catharsis, or acting out, and a therapeutic split in the ego, in which one becomes a witness to one's experience. All of these elements presuppose a normal, neurotic level of functioning. In Engler's view, those with poorly defined and weakly integrated representations of self and others cannot tolerate uncovering techniques or the painful effects which emerge. Thus inside techniques like Vipassana run the risk of further fragmenting an already vulnerable sense of self. The Jungian Critique of Meditation First, a quote. Your vision will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. Who looks outside, dreams, who looks inside, awakens. Carl Jung. In 1949 d. T. Suzuki wrote a book called An Introduction to Zen Buddhism which featured a 30-page introduction by Carl Jung. And although C.G. Jung, while considerably more open to religious or spiritual experiences than many psychoanalytic theoreticians, consistently advised Westerners against the use of Eastern meditation techniques. 
Westerners do not need more control and more power over themselves and over nature, he wrote, we need to return to our own nature, not systems and methods to control or repress the natural man. Before Westerners can safely practice yoga or meditation, Jung says, we must first know our own unconscious nature. Jung believes that psychotherapy is a more appropriate form of introversion for Westerners, one which permits the making conscious of unconscious components of the self. No discipline ought to be imposed on the unconscious, Jung emphasizes, for this would reinforce the cramping effect of consciousness. Instead, everything must be done to help the unconscious mind reach the conscious mind and free it of its rigidity. Thus Jung prescribes active imagination, in which one switches off consciousness and allows unconscious contents to unfold. How do we balance psychological and spiritual development? Russell believes that therapy and meditation differ significantly with respect to their aims, their experiential areas, and their techniques. Meditation is not a method to alleviate psychopathology. Russell states, and in recent years the expectation that meditation would be an effective psychotherapy has largely been reversed. Meditation helps one achieve higher states of consciousness, but is not focused on resolving emotional problems. Therapy, however, aims at exploration of the unconscious, rather than the higher states of consciousness sought in meditation. Wellwood summed up this view when he wrote that the aim of psychotherapy is self-integration, while the aim of meditation is self-transcendence. In his earlier years Sigmund Freud experimented with hypnosis. He found it a useful tool in revealing unconscious feelings and conflicts to the therapist, but it was of little value to the patient. The reason was that hypnotic trance precluded the patient from consciously confronting and resolving his problems. Therefore, Freud abandoned hypnosis in preference to the now standard procedures of psychiatry and psychoanalysis. Similarly, the Buddha rejected the use of trance states so common in yogic practice and developed a means by which people can acquire insight without the aid of a therapist or psychedelic drugs. Positive Psychology and the Buddhist Path of Compassion Very little scientific research or theoretical thought has gone into understanding positive emotions or the psychology of human strengths and well-being. Among positive emotions, compassion has been particularly neglected in our Western tradition of psychology. Freud once advised psychoanalysts to model themselves during the psychoanalytic treatment on the surgeon, who puts aside all his feelings, even his human sympathy. Heinz Cohen, who is very well known for his work on the psychological importance of empathy, warned psychologists that empathy, which he defines as a tool for understanding the contents of other people's minds, should not be confused with such fuzzily related meanings as kindness, compassion, and sympathy. From a scientific perspective, when something is not clearly defined and cannot readily be weighed or measured, it is almost as though that thing does not exist. And yet, we can certainly all recognize that love and compassion do indeed exist and are certainly as real and as important as anger or anxiety. Over the past few years a number of researchers have begun studying the positive psychology of compassion. As Buddhism places such a great emphasis on compassion as a cause of happiness and well-being, much of this growing interest has been initiated through the dialogue between Buddhism and Western psychology. In particular, a number of leading researchers have begun studying compassion as a result of ongoing dialogues with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Dr. Richard Davidson has studied the brains of meditators, discovering that meditation seems to strengthen connections and functioning in those parts of the brain that calm such feelings as fear or anger. When Dr. Davidson did a study of the brain waves of an experienced meditator he found the highest level of activity ever seen in brain areas associated with happiness and positive emotions. In general, research suggests that meditation supports the development of positive emotions. And, preliminary research findings seem to suggest that meditation of loving-kindness and compassion are associated with feelings of happiness. From a Buddhist perspective, this is certainly no surprise. For many centuries now, Buddhist practitioners in the great monastic universities first of India and then of Tibet, Mongolia, Bhutan, and other Buddhist nations have been systematically studying positive psychology. And, perhaps the most significant and practical psychological finding from all of those centuries of inner science is this, the most powerful way of becoming happy is developing compassion. In the West, we often associate feelings of love or compassion with weakness. Borrowing from Buddhism's tradition of positive psychology can help us to remember that compassion can also be powerful. 
Even the best meditators have old wounds to heal and therefore mediation practice has its limitations. Some helpful conclusions for our practice. 1. For most people, meditation practice doesn't do it all. 2. The various compartments of our minds and bodies are only semi-permeable to awareness. Awareness of certain aspects does not automatically carry over to the other aspect, especially when our fear and woundedness are deep. Mindfulness works only when we are willing to direct attention to every area of our suffering. 3. Meditation and spiritual practice can easily be used to suppress and avoid feeling or to escape from difficult areas of our lives. Many people resist the personal and psychological roots of their suffering. 4. There are many areas of growth such as grief and other unfinished business, communication and maturing of relationships, sexuality and intimacy, career and work issues, certain fears and phobias, early wounds, where good Western therapy is on the whole much quicker and more successful than meditation. 5. Does this mean we should trade meditation for psychotherapy? No. In 1978 James Budgentle said psychotherapy is the art, science, and practice of studying the nature of consciousness and of what may reduce or facilitate it. The relationship between psychotherapy and spirituality is determined in part by how we define psychotherapy. The variety of psychotherapeutic approaches available today has been broadly divided into four areas, psychoanalytic, behavioral, humanistic, and transpersonal. Of these, only the transpersonal orientation explicitly addresses itself to spiritual issues. While developmental maps are useful as a frame of reference, life never fits neatly into a theoretical schema. Psychotherapy is often perceived as being remedial, that is, as useful for healing emotional wounds of the past. Yet this is only part of what can happen in therapy. Growth-oriented psychotherapy is not restricted to a medical model of remedial work. Existential questions related to freedom and the search for meaning inevitably open up spiritual issues. Whenever a person faces an existential crisis or a close encounter with death, spiritual concerns tend to surface. Thus psychotherapy that addresses life's deepest questions has profound spiritual implications. In the context of a therapeutic relationship, the therapist, unlike some spiritual teachers, does not impose beliefs on the client. By facilitating awareness of limiting beliefs, however, psychotherapy can accelerate and assist the process of spiritual development. The success of cognitive therapeutic modalities indicates the powerful effects of beliefs on everyday life. Consciously choosing beliefs in a time when a wide range of teachings are available is a challenge that may also be explored in the context of therapy. The goal of both psychotherapy and spiritual practice is often thought to be the relief of suffering. Psychotherapy however, posits wholeness as a goal rather than perfection, and striving to attain a spiritual ideal can, from a therapeutic perspective, be an obstacle to healing. Yet psychotherapy and spirituality also have a great deal in common. In particular, many of the processes that contribute to psychological health and well-being contribute to spiritual growth as well. For example, the following processes are an integral part of both psychological and spiritual development. Telling the truth. Communicating the truth about inner experience is essential for effective change and growth. Psychotherapy provides a safe space for this. Releasing negative emotions. Letting go of fear, guilt and anger can be facilitated by therapeutic interventions and is valuable for both personal and spiritual work. Effort and consistency. Progress in personal and spiritual development can be enhanced by effort and consistency, although too much effort may be counterproductive. Understanding resistance in psychotherapy can be valuable for anyone exploring spiritual growth. The ability to make a consistent effort, to follow through on intentions, and to behave in a way that is consistent with professed beliefs are fundamental requirements for all inner work. Authenticity and Trust Authenticity is strengthened when what one says and does accurately reflects what one thinks and feels. It is necessary if one is to avoid self-deception and develop self-trust. When people feel untrustworthy, they cannot trust their perceptions of others or the world. Self-trust is necessary when choosing a therapist or a teacher. Integrity and Wholeness Integrity results from the practice of authenticity, and wholeness depends on accepting all one's experiences. Allowing things to be as they are rather than living in a world of illusion and denial is basic for psychological health and spiritual growth. Insight and Forgiveness To understand all is to forgive all. 
In spiritual practice one is taught to forgive others, in psychotherapy one learns to forgive oneself. Both are necessary for complete forgiveness and well-being. Love. Psychotherapy and spiritual practice can both lead to opening the heart and developing the capacity to give and receive love. Spirituality awakens the awareness of love's presence in our lives, psychotherapy cultivates love and relationship. Awareness. Depth psychotherapy and spiritual practice both cultivate awareness and non-judgmental attention. A therapist who helps clients develop self-awareness can benefit from the meditation practice that enhances sensitivity to nuances of experiences. Liberation. Both psychotherapy and spiritual practice can contribute to liberation from limiting self-concepts. Freedom from fear and delusion, from the past, and from early conditioning are common goals. Most psychotherapy tends to work with the contents of consciousness, with the aim of reducing pain and conflict and enhancing the capacity for love and work. This can be characterized as working on the content of the dream, exchanging nightmares for happier, more peaceful dreams. Ideally, spiritual practice is aimed at waking up and becoming aware of the nature of the dream and who the dreamer is. At its best, transpersonal psychotherapy aims at doing both. Both psychotherapy and spiritual practice contribute to psychological health and spiritual growth. Unresolved psychological issues can impede healthy developments at any stage, and sometimes such issues surface only after much spiritual practice. The seeker must beware of the limitations of both therapists and spiritual teachers. Expertise in one domain does not make one an authority in the other, and few individuals are well trained in both. Psychological and spiritual development are inextricably intertwined, and both continue throughout life. In practice both psychotherapist and spiritual teachers do what they can to relieve suffering and help people grow in consciousness. Grief and the Mindfulness Approach, Death, Dying, and Bereavement Counseling if attachment is natural then grief is a natural emotion that is experienced when one is parted from what is dear. If grief is dealt with effectively it can initiate insight. However, if it is dealt with unskillfully, complications may arise. The normal grief reaction may manifest physically, emotionally, cognitively and or behaviorally. Grief may have phases. However, some health workers encourage a task-oriented approach to more actively enable a bereaved person to process and resolve their grief reaction. One way of effectively dealing with grief is that of the Theravadan Buddhists' practice of mindfulness. Mindfulness means staying aware of mind and body conditions in the present moment context. The task-oriented approach can utilize mindfulness, and mindfulness may also be evident in many modern psychotherapies. Traditional mind tools to encourage mindfulness may be used in collaboration with a counselor, therapist as well as in solitary practice. With mindfulness a bereaved person can more effectively acknowledge the reality of loss and allow the pains of grief to manifest without further complication. If the pain is experienced without undue reaction, the undermining effect and manifestation of grief can be resolved and the bereaved person can function relatively free from impediment. Grief is a common emotion that human beings experience when they are parted from that to which they are attached. Its effect can be painful and debilitating. Probably the most debilitating type of grief occurs when a loved one dies. If the grief is not dealt with effectively the grief can become pathological and create a situation where the bereaved person is unable to function in the world adequately. Bowlby argues that attachment is developed in animals, humans included, because it has a survival value. If attachment is natural then it is also natural to grieve. The pains of grief is just as much a part of life as the joy of love, it is, perhaps, the price we pay for love, the cost of commitment. The resolution of grief can be accomplished by developing mindfulness. The practice of mindfulness, also called satipatthana, emphasizes being aware and surrendering to the natural and present moment conditions of mind and body. This is primarily a Theravadan Buddhist approach. However, Elements of its practice can be found within common task-oriented and supportive grief counseling techniques as well as some modern psychotherapies. If grief is dealt with effectively it can become a tool for the development of great insight. If on the other hand it is dealt with unskillfully it could initiate a whole chain of chronic dysfunction, confusion, depression, avoidance behaviors and general unhappiness. The complications of the grief reaction are many. However in the manifestation of a normal grief there are many common types of reaction. There can be feelings such as sadness, anger, guilt, anxiety, loneliness, shock, yearning, numbness, helplessness etc., 
physical sensations which include fatigue, tightness in the chest, a dry mouth, a hollow feeling in the stomach, tightness in the throat and more, various thoughts that can lead to depression, obsessions, confusion or even hallucinations, and behaviors such as disturbed sleep, social withdrawal, crying, neurotic responses to old possessions and memories, absent-mindedness, searching and calling out, restless overactivity and so on. 2500 years ago the Buddha, used a performance-based technique to help a bereaved woman accept the reality of her child's death. The woman's child died not long after it could walk, and in a distressed state the woman wandered the streets for days with the child in her arms asking everyone for a medicine to save her child. The Buddha seeing her behavior told her that he knew of a medicine to help her but first she had to collect a handful of mustard seeds, each one from a house that had not seen death. As she went from house to house unable to collect the seeds she realized that death, in general and the death of her child in particular, was a reality. Through insight she discarded her irrational behavior. Da Silva compared this technique to Ellis's rational emotive therapy. A common performance-based technique used to help the bereaved accept the reality of a loved one's death is that of encouraging the survivor to see the body. Barbara Walsh claimed that research has shown that when a body is viewed it assists the bereaved to deal with the reality. Barbara Walsh pointed out though that one should be sensitive to the way that this is done. One should not for example say, would you like to see the body? But instead say something like I think it would help if you said goodbye too. The Satpathon technique is a client-centered approach and so gives the bereaved the freedom and dignity to work by themselves without being overly influenced by a counselor-slash-therapist's expectations or preordained pattern of what should happen. Satpathana, however, is not always suitable for everyone, nor is its solitary introspection techniques appropriate at all times. The grieving process can be extremely overwhelming or complicated. There are times of course when a bereaved person needs close contact and support of a counselor, therapist. The support person could act as a source of strength, compassion, insight or merely help reflect the bereaved situation, and so even when the awareness seems to be externalized the process of satipathana can be utilized. Rogerian techniques incorporate empathetic listening and non-judgmental reflection, and so the acceptance, recognition and clarification of mind-body conditions have a healing effect. Worden claims that repeated verbalization about the event helps bring home the reality of the situation. Whilst Collar says that 3 out of 16 important points to follow in helping the bereaved are to number 14 listen, number 15 listen and number 16 listen. In accordance with the Satpathana approach in the completion of Worden's tasks, Gestalt therapy encourages being concerned with the present rather than the past or the future, dealing with what appears rather than what is absent, experiencing things rather than imagining them feeling rather than thinking, expressing feelings rather than justifying or explaining them, being aware of pain as well as pleasure and surrendering to the kind of person one is. A more positive view has already been introduced into psychology, though not from Buddhism. Martin Seligman, a psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania, has spearheaded a large movement in psychology to study more vigorously positive states and experiences, like flow during optimal performance, as well as motivations like compassion. The movement has come in reaction to the earlier out-of-proportion focus on negative states and dysfunction that typified psychology in the last century.